part of life. Again, how you deal with it is what makes you a champion or what makes you just a normal person. Is it worth it? Is the end goal worth all the hard work that you're putting through? Is it worth dragging yourself out of bed when your body's in pain? I remember when I dropped him with the left hook, his eyes rolled into his head and then he came back up and he started smiling at me and he didn't have a gum shield in and he had blood all over his teeth. Welcome back to Mulligan Brewers. Today we interview Liam, the Hitman Harrison, a champion Muay Thai fighter, famed for having one of the most aggressive Muay Thai fighting styles. 87 wins, 48 by way of knockout. He's remained ranked number one in the UK since the age of 17. I'm Liam Harrison, I'm eight time world Muay Thai champion. I've been training now at the Bad Company Gym in Leeds for about 21 years. I've had 115 pro fights, around 89 wins and 48 by knockout. You say you train at Badco in Leeds and you've lived in Leeds all your life, right? Yep. Can you describe to people what it's like to live in this area of kind of your experiences? Um, it's a bit rough around here, to be honest. Uh, it's um, a bit of a council estate. It's, there's a thing in Leeds and everyone says, oh, I'm from LS9 and they say it proudly because that's where I'm meant to be all artist fighters and stuff I'm meant to come from, which is what this gym is, LS9, and that's where I live, uh, LS9. But yeah, it's, it's not been too bad. It's, it is a bit rough, but uh, I, I mentioned earlier before, like if you, if you can't fight around here, you'll get eaten alive on, on these streets. When you was growing up, did you get in fights before you even entered New Thai? Did you fight in the street before you came into the gym? <sighs> A little bit, yeah. Uh, it was never the fact that I was never like going out bullying or all that, but like I just said, then it is a bit of a rough area and you do have to be able to stand up to people around here and look after yourself. I was never one to go out looking for fights or anything like that because, like I just said, I, I wouldn't want a bully and it was just want something that appealed to me going out and starting fights, but I did have to look out for myself a little bit. So it, it did just happen, especially when you've got so many people from a similar sort of environment with a similar mindset and stuff like that. It, it, it's a bit of a recipe for disaster sometimes. Growing up in Leeds, your family situation, what was it like? Did you have brothers and sisters, mum and dad, how was that? I'm an only child. Um, I've always lived at home with my, just my mum and my dad. Um, solid household. My dad a hard worker, mum's a hard worker. Uh, my dad were a bit rough when he was younger himself, like, but he, uh, he settled down at a young age with my mum and I was born and they, he, he started to behave himself and stuff then. Growing up as an only child, did you think at some points in time that you had to kind of carve a path for yourself, obviously you didn't have brothers and sisters to do it, was that motivation? To be honest, uh, my mum's sister, she had a, a son, my cousin Andy, he's also a five-time world champion. He were always, he's been, he's six years older than me and I used to like follow a lot of his footsteps and what he did and stuff. Um, he was... 20, no, 21 when he first brought me down. No, 20 when he first brought me down in Bad Company and I was 13. And he was the one who got me involved in Thai boxing and stuff like that. So I was lucky, really. Even though we weren't brothers, he was like a brother to me. And we spent a lot of time together. We were together like most days through the week and stuff. He used to come and pick me up from school and he'd take me to the gym. Or I played football a lot as well. He'd come and take me to football and stuff. So he was like, he was like a, an older brother for me. You spoke about Andy obviously bringing you to the gym. What were the main reasons you kind of got into Thai boxing? What was the first time you came to the gym? What was it like for you? Uh, well, Andy just messaged me one day. I was playing football a lot at um, a decent level. I played for Farsi Celtic, which are a semi-professional team. I trialled at Leeds, Barnsley and Sheffield, Sheffield Wednesday, but I never quite, I quite made the cut. Um, so I was playing at a good level and he just said, oh, do you want to come down and try it? I've just started, do you want to come try it? Um, it be, might be good for your fitness. Uh, and he knew I was getting into like the odd fight and stuff outside the, the, the gym and said it'll be good just so you can look after yourself a bit better and stuff like that. And I remember that I remember it like it was yesterday, the first day I came down. Uh, this gym, even then, it had a good reputation. There were a lot of British champions, Commonwealth champions. And I remember just walking through them doors back there and I was just thinking, wow, this is amazing. Um, and I just fell in love straight away. And eventually, like football started to take a bit of a, a back burner. I was playing them both, I was doing both side by side for about three years. There were a lot of times when I'd even I had a football trial at Barnsley on Saturday and I had a fight on Sunday. And uh, I had to go straight from my football trial at Barnsley to weigh in for the fight. So I was doing that, I think about 15 when I did that. So I was doing it by, side by side for a long time. How, how old was you when you first came? 13, I yeah, 13. I had my first fight at 14. Well, I had a junior fight first when I was 13, and but that was with all padding on. But I was big for my age, even though I'm only pretty small now. I was still pretty big. Um, I fight now at 63.5 kilo. My first fight were at 60 kilo 
so they don't want much size difference at all. You said you started fighting at 14, was that professional? Uh, my first pro fight, I had a junior fight at 13 and my first pro fight at 14. Is that legal to fight at 14? <laughs> no, <laughs> well, they've, they've changed everything now, I think you've got to like, fight pro now, I think you've got to be 18, but back then it was 16. And um, I was lucky, no one ever asked for any sort of idea or anything like that, or like a, a passport or anything when we used to fight. They just say, have you got a fight? And Richard used to say, I've got a 16 year old lad. And uh, yeah, no one ever questioned it because I, I looked quite old for my age and, and so I got away with it. And then, but I ended up like fighting men. So I was like 14 fighting men. I think when I was 15, I fought a 20, 28 year old, I think you were. I knocked him out. <laughs> How do you deal with that kind of pressure? Obviously you're still, you're still not a man at this point. And you, you're coming into a gym where there's a lot of British champions, a lot of good fighters, and then you go into the ring fighting full-grown men. How do you deal with that pressure? How do you cope with it? I was a bit young and probably just a bit cocky and arrogant, and it just did never ever used to cross my mind that I was fighting a fully grown man at all. It was just like, this is the fight, and I, I, I just loved it. Um, I was training in here alongside a lot of good fighters at the time as well, and I was holding my own with them, so there were never any really confidence issues or anything like that. I just used to get in there because I used to love it. I used to walk around school and playground, just daydreaming about when my next fight where I'll be sat in class, not paying any attention whatsoever. All I could think about was getting out and going to the gym. And eventually I started on the dinner hour running from my school, which is just down the road, up to the gym, doing some quick pads with Richard and then running back to school. And that was like my, on my dinner hour and stuff like that. So I, I was obsessed by the sport and I was obsessed with fighting. And um, so it never really crossed my mind that I might get hurt here. And I um, went my first like 29 pro fights unbeaten. So I, it never really like, crossed my mind that I could get hurt or there could be an possible injury or anything like that. I had tunnel vision of everyone I got in there with, I thought, I'm gonna knock them out. I think my first three fights, I knocked them all out first round, I think. It's interesting that you kind of skip school to run to the gym, to do pads and then to go back to school. Did you kind of know at that point in your life, 14, 15, that you was gonna be committed to this forever? You said you're obsessive. How did that start? Uh, yeah, I probably did, to be honest. I, I, I knew just as soon as I had my first fight, I thought that was amazing. There'd never been no adrenaline in, in rush like it in football or anything like that, which is what I was playing at the time. And I just thought, I thought, wow, I, I would love this to be my life. And I will remember watching some of the fighters who were the top level then back in that day, and they were all getting fights abroad, and they were in this magazine that I used to buy every week from WH Smith, and I used to see them in this magazine. And I used to think, oh, I want my face on there. I'd love to, love to be on the front cover of that magazine like some of these guys are. So yeah, it just, it just took over my life totally. Um, like I say, some mornings I would just run to school as my fitness. Uh, and on, uh, as soon as school finished, I'd run back home. And then from there, I'd just run to the gym. So that were helping out my fitness for football and for my fighting and stuff as well. I'd be in here every chance I got. Like, and my mates were saying, oh, you're coming out tonight. I said, nah, I can't, I'm in the gym. I'd be here literally like four or five nights a week. Um, which was good as well because, like I said before, like you said, it's a bit of a rough area, so like there's kids getting up to mischief a lot around here. So it took me off the streets, it taught me discipline, it it taught me a lot of things. But uh, yeah, I was obsessed by it from an early age. How how important is that obsession? If you want to be successful at what you do, how important is it? It's key in anything in life, in any role in life. I believe if you want to be the best at it, you've got to be obsessed by it. You've got to give your life it. You've got to live it. You've got to breathe it. You've got to be that going to go, willing to go that extra mile just where certain people aren't willing to go. Because if you want to get to where anyone can come in a gym and kick the pads and spar and do this, but when they're tired, it depends. Are they willing to do another round? Are they going to get back on the pads afterwards? When you can't breathe anymore, you know, you've been hurt to the body in the middle of a, like round 10 of sparring and a fresh opponent comes in, are they going to get out? Are you going to stay in and you're going to keep going? So obsession is massively important in anything, not just fighting, just in any walk of life where you want to be successful. With obsession, the kind of obsession that you had, there must come sacrifices. What kind of sacrifices do you make to kind of the job that you do? You know what, when most kids are like 15 and 16, they're probably going to be on park getting pissed and stuff like that. I, I missed a lot of that, and but it's not like a bad thing. It was a good thing. This kept me away from doing all that. Don't get me wrong, there the odd night where I got a bit pissed and stuff like that. But what my dad used to do is if I were ever getting out of line, he wouldn't like take my PlayStation away or do anything like that. He'd march me down here and Richard would say to me, right, if you carry on doing this, you're not allowed to train. And I'd be like, fucking hell, I'm not, I'm not allowed to say that. I'd be like, oh no, I'm not allowed to train. I better behave myself because if this were gone, this were the biggest part of my life gone and I would not have known what to do with myself. So like, I never got grounded. I, just, you know, I never got anything like that. He just brought me down here and said, right, can't train if you carry on 
messing about on the street or drinking or being bad. So that just wiped out a lot of that aspect of my, my junior life. Obviously, as I got older and my friends were going out and stuff, I've had to miss a lot of things like parties and nights out and stuff like that. But I wouldn't change it for the world, you know. You, you can go out on the piss anytime, but like for the, the life I've led and the, con the experiences I've had and stuff like that, I would not change a thing. I have sacrificed a lot and I probably missed out on a lot, but I've gained a lot more. You spoke about getting in the ring and doing that extra round or running that extra mile. That's what you was willing to do. Can you recollect on um, any times where you've really pushed your body or really tested yourself and it's been a standout moment where you've gone that extra mile more than anybody else would go? I was having a fight, it was about 2010, against one of the heaviest punchers uh, there was ever been of all time. His name ran away at Samrit. We'd fought before and in the first fight, he absolutely destroyed me. But I knew, I knew I could beat him and I thought there was just something not right that night and I knew I could beat him, so I begged and begged the promoter over here to bring him to England. I said, I can let me fight him in England in front of everyone because I don't want everyone thinking that I'm just getting smashed to beat. It was the first time I'd ever been stopped in a fight. And I got him to England. We fought at the MEN Arena, one of the biggest stadiums in, in England. And all my friends and all my family were there. And I remember the camp for that fight. I'd, what I'd usually do were about eight weeks. Um, and But because I was fighting so regular at the time, a lot of, I might have, a lot of my fights might have only been like eight weeks apart. So I'd have one fight I'd train eight weeks for, and then I might only have four weeks, have another fight, and then I might only have three weeks and have another fight, so I'm fighting so regular. But for this fight, I didn't accept any other fights. I just had 12 weeks. And I remember on Christmas, I had a drink on Christmas Day with my family, and I said, right, that's me done till the end of March. I said, I'm not going out, not going anywhere other than the gym. Um, I went to Thailand for the first part of it, and I came back, and then I just lived in this gym for 12 weeks. And uh, I beat him comfortably. And I knew I could, I knew I could do it. And it was just like everything I did for that fight, I did more sparring than anyone else in the gym. I ran the few more miles. We usually run like five miles before training. I ran running seven. Sometimes I ran 10 and then still came in here. Uh, I had to be a bit smart because I was training so hard that my body was getting really tired. But if that happened, I just took a day off or two days off and I looked after myself and I did everything right. And I, I beat him easily. And, um, he was the current stadium champion at the time. He had an 80% KO ratio, which were higher than any other Thai fighter around. And to beat him that easily in front of all my friends and family, um, I'll never ever forget that as long as I live. It seems to be a lot of focus on that task. Um, and then something that interests me is kind of, where do, you, where do you get the motivation to do that? How do you stay focused for that long? Because a lots of fighters are focused and lots of people who are successful are focused. But how do you do it for such a long period of time? Was it something that came from your younger years? Was it something that came from training? Is it something that someone installed in you? I've, I've, I've always had like an addictive personality. Like when the first time I played football, I, 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 I don't want to do something unless I'm the best at it. Like when I played football, I was always the best in my team. And like I said, I, I made it to the level where I was trying, trying for pro clubs and stuff like that. When I walked through this door, I did not want to just fight to like turn up to fights and make up the numbers or anything like that. I wanted to be a champion and that was that. And I'd always stay behind afterwards and after the class I'd go on the bag upstairs on my own. I even used to stand in the mirror and like film myself on my old crappy phones and stuff and like make sure my stance were okay and stuff like that. Uh, and I think even before that, even before camera phones were around when I was about 13, 14, I used to use my, my, my digicam, my dad's recorder and stuff and just film myself to make sure I thought my stance were okay and stuff like that. And that's like, I think, sort of mentality that takes you from being just a, a fighter to a champion. Talking about kind of being a perfectionist there, making sure that you get everything right. Has there been any points in, in your career where you felt like quitting or maybe this wouldn't be for you anymore? Um, I had a stage in my mid twenties and I'd had a lot of fights by then. And what happened was I had four losses on the bounce. I had two of them under rules that I never fought under, K1, um, which, I only did it because there was a lot of money at stake in tournaments. Realised, oh, that was rubbish. And then my next two fights were against Sanchai, who was the greatest fighter of this generation for the last 25 years, and another stadium champion, Ty. And I lost both of them, and I'm thinking, four in a row. Even though the two of them, under the rules that I never fought for, thought you could wipe down, but I said, it's still not acceptable. It's four in a row. I thought, am I doing something wrong here? And um, I thought to myself, right, I'm having a year off. I'm, I'm not, not doing this anymore. I had about two weeks off and then someone got a call and said, do you want to fight in three weeks? All right, let's roll. And I did it and I won and I was back. And that's, 
it was tough at the time thinking, oh, what am I doing, what am I doing? But I realised I'm doing it because I love it. And even in the, the, the fights where I've been getting a bit of an hiding, I remember still at that point, I'll be thinking, this is ace. This is just, it's just, it's just what I love doing and where I feel at home. It's interesting that you, you've got a doubt in your mind and then obviously you were thinking about giving it up for a year, but then you managed to do it for two weeks. Mm. There's a lot of people who get doubts in their mind. Are they doing the right thing? Are they falling off? Is this going to work for them? What kind of advice would you give them when they get them doubts in their mind to kind of counteract them? You know what, you've got like a devil and an angel on your shoulder all the time and that devil just needs to be, knock it off because you're always going to have these doubts. You know what, I come in here some days, I'll be training for a fight and I'll train three days in a row and I'll be on fire and I'll have one bad day, which is expected when you're doing like an eight week camp or anything like that. I'll have one bad day and that bad day outweighs the good three days by a mile and I'll go on thinking, oh I'm shit, I'm shit, what am I doing? What am I doing here? I'm going to get battered in this fight. But then you come back in the next morning, you have one good session again and that doubt's gone again. So you just, it, it's hard to, to get rid of them demons. And I think every top athlete will have some doubts always creep in, but it's the ones who just manage to just ignore them and knock them to one side and just think like, oh, it's part and parcel of it. You're always, no matter what you're doing, I'm pretty sure Usain Bolt must think sometimes, think, oh, shit, what if, uh, what if Johnson or someone else beats me at this race or something like that, you know? It must just creep in at some point, but they're so mentally strong, they just go, book, don't matter. It's gone and then they'll be back to the tunnel vision. Um, I think any athlete who says that they never have any sort of doubts so is, is lying. I think everyone's got one that creeps in somewhere, but it's the ones who just manage to just push them to one side and keep the tunnel vision and keep the... What I do is I visualise after the fight. I don't visualise what's going to happen in the fight because I never know. I just always visualise what it's like to win after the fight, what I'll be doing after the fight, how I'll feel after the fight. And I think doing that, that always helps you stay mentally strong. So when you took the 12-week training camp, all for that training camp, are you visualising the end goal, getting your hand raised, what people are going to say, making your friends and family proud? Does, how often does that creep into your mind when you're doing your training camp? Um, you need to come back and like things are, when, it, when it gets hard and it's difficult, you just need to think about that. It was my dad's birthday, that fight as well. It was the 27th of March, 2010. I'll never forget it. So I used to think about that. Oh, dad's birthday, I can't lose here. It's going to be there. Everyone's going to be there. I need to put on a clinic because at that time everyone was saying I oh, was the best fight in the UK but then obviously he'd stop me so everyone was like oh maybe maybe Liam isn't that good maybe he's just been found out here so then I was thinking have I just been found out I'm like, oh, sure these have been found out so I was like fighting against myself my own demons I had to stay mentally strong to show that I was more than that and then what he did were in that first fight he stopped me in round three with leg kicks and uh, he came out in round one and he started straight away to try and blast my leg to bits in the first fight, I sat down after round one and my leg was in agony. And by the end of round five of him still kicking my fight in the rematch, I couldn't feel a thing still. But my mindset was so mentally strong then, I think he could have hit me with an iron bar in that fight and I wouldn't have felt it. After the fight, he hit me with a left hook in round four and he wobbled me a bit. And I remember thinking, oh shit, if he hits me again here, I might go. And I said to myself in my head, just call him on, he won't know. So I went, come on. And he just stopped and I thought, oh, I got away with that one. After the fight, the ambulance had to come and take me to hospital because I passed out in the after party and I got took to hospital, I'd stay in overnight and I had a really bad concussion. And that was with how hard he hit me in round four, but I, would, I was in such a, a mental focus that it didn't even have any effect till after the fight. It's crazy how we're speaking about mind over, over matter. We're talking about stuff like phys physical pain. Do you believe you can get yourself in the zone mentally that you can overcome anything at a certain moment in time? If so, like, how do you create that mindset to get yourself in that place? Yeah, I, I believe you can. I believe your mind's your strongest weapon and your body will, yeah, your mind will give up before your body long ever does. You just need to tell yourself it won't, like David Goggins and people like, look what they do with their, their body and it's their mind that's making them do it. Um, I've worked with a mind coach before called Vinnie Shawman and we've done like little bits of work and I, I worked with him for that rematch. And uh, it's hard to explain what he does with people because he does some, it, what he does is, is different for everyone. But I just, my mindset was so strong from working with him. It, was, it took a few weeks and just a few sessions just to instill a few key words into my head. And what he had my corner team doing was, one of the key words was warrior. So the, he had my corner team saying, Liam, you're a warrior, blah, blah, this, that and that. And it just helped like keep me so focused and so, you're focused on the task at hand and stuff like that. It's really hard to explain unless you've ever like, done it yourself and stuff like that. Because like I said, it, what he does with everyone is different. But uh, what he did with that, I mean, for that fight were unbelievable. It sounds like you have to have a good team around you to succeed. The 
people you keep around you, how important is it to be mixing and mingling with people that are supporting you and driving you forward? I've been so lucky to train at this gym, to walk through these doors. There's five other Thai boxing gyms around this part of Leeds. And if I would have walked into any of the others, I wouldn't have been where I was today. Um, Richard, my coach, he was British Commonwealth and European champion. He had around 50 fights, so he was very experienced himself. And then Andy, who brought me to the gym, he was, he's ended up being five-time world champion. Me and him trained together every day religiously, and we still do now. Um, then we had Jordan Watson. Again, he's two years younger than me, but he was here at the time and he was already junior British champion. Me and him grown up fighting. He turned out to be three times world champion, fought all the best fighters at his weight. He fought Bukau and people like that. And Yodson Clay was some of the biggest names in the sport. Um, and then we had like other world champions, James France, who's my main sparring partner. And he was, uh, everyone said he was the best technical fighter England's ever had. Then we had David Mack, world champion, Rich Cadden, world champion, Lisa Horton, world champion. We had about, 10 world champions all in the gym at one time. And I think every other gym in England, lucky to have one or two. And we had 10 all in one place. So if it weren't for these guys here, uh, I'd, I don't know if I'd have got anywhere near like the level of success because we were like a family, but we always to drive each other up. If one person were looking a bit fit and sharp on pads, it'd always push us, we can't have that. He's gonna knack us next time we're sparring. He's gonna batter us, we can't have that, we need to get. So like when we're out running before the, the session, if someone starts to pull away, it's like, no, you can't have that. You've got to, they were like, always that friendly, competitive edge. But when you're, you're sparring and stuff like that, it started to get a bit heated and stuff. And you've got elite level world champions. You've got to be on sharp. You've got to be on point. You've got to be on the ball. Being sharp, being on point, being on the ball. Kind of your daily routine. What do you do on a daily basis or what have you done in the past that's different from other people that will give you an edge on your competition or something that's a little bit unique or different that you do that you believe separates you and makes you elite at what you do? Oh, it's a tough one, that. Um, getting the right training method, it's been a lot of trial and error over the years because obviously I've been doing it for so long now. Everyone has to do what's right for their body. I know a lot of like fighters who will get up in the morning and run seven, eight miles straight off. Now I don't do any of that because I think it takes too much out of your knees and it ruins your session too much. I do sprint training and because it's a bit more sport specific and I know like a lot of fighters don't really do too much of this. Um, but if you want to be explosive and, and fast and have fast twitch muscles and stuff like that, I think sprint work is very important for that. But I know a lot of fighters who will just get up and just go running for like real slow for seven, eight miles on a morning, which I don't think that's very sport specific at all really. When you fight, you fight in burst. You don't fight like plodding like you do like that. Um, but my training regimes have been just pretty similar to what everyone else does really. I, I come down, I hit the pads, but I will I'll hit the pads intensely every single time. When I spar, I have it in my head that I'm not gonna lose, right, I'm not gonna lose a round tonight. I'm getting in there with 10 world champions, right, I'm not gonna lose a round. And if I do lose a round, I'll make sure I'll make the, win the next one even more convincingly, you know? Um, but it's just it's similar to every other every other top level fighter. I clinch, I spar, I do my strength and conditioning, I'll do my sprints. I'll just make sure I try and push myself as far as I can. And I'm lucky that I've had the training partners around me to push me. There might be a world champion at a gym, say down in London, who hasn't. He might be a champion. He might be training just as hard as I do. He might kick the pads just as hard. He might hit the bag just as hard. But if he ain't got other ten world champions around him pushing in sparring, I've got the edge. You also you've travelled far and wide with what you do. So you, you spoke a lot about being here in Leeds and the people you've had around you, but you, you took yourself to Thailand to learn your craft and you lived in conditions which some people probably wouldn't have put up with. What made you do that and what were your experiences like over there? It was after my 29th, oh, my 30th fight. I went 29 fights unbeaten and my 30th fight, I fought a Thai champion. And um, he was like elite level, top, top level. I'd never fought anyone that good. I'd fought a few ties before who were good fighters and I'd stopped them, but I'd never fought one of the best of the best. I fought good Europeans and I'd stopped them as well, but like the elite level guys, this was my first time at that level. I was 18, I'd been to Thailand once myself. I'd not, not fought there, I'd just stayed there for three weeks just to do a bit of the, the training and stuff. And in round two, I knocked this guy down with the left hook and I just thought, oh, he's just the same as every other fighter. I'll finish him off now and that's that. I went in to finish him off, he survived the round, and then he got up and in round three, four and five, he destroyed me. And I mean, he just wiped the floor with me. I remember when I dropped him with the left hook, 
his eyes rolled into his head and then he came back up and he started smiling at me and he didn't have a gum shield in and he had blood all over his teeth. And I thought, this guy's crazy. And he just, he absolutely destroyed me, battered me. And I remember after the fight, I was thinking, right, if I want to fight these guys, I need to be able to know how they fight as well as how I fight. And if I can mix both the styles together, then I'm going to be just as dangerous or if not more dangerous than the, the, these guys are. So. I just said I, I was seeing a girl for the time as well. I've been seeing her for three years. I just went home, went, I'm sorry, it's over. I'm off to live in Thailand. And that was it. I just, she was devastated. And I said to my mum, I said, Mum, muff. That's it. And just went two years. So after that fight, did you literally just decide to get up, go? And that fight were on the 29th of November. And then I went on the 15th of December before Christmas. So everyone was mad at me for ruining Christmas. But I said, this, I, said I can't have this in my head over Christmas because my head is going to go. I need to like go out there and just make sure that and see if I can live at that level. I don't want to be like the nearly guy. I said I want to get that level and I want to be the one that is getting in the ring knowing I'm going to win at that level. I don't want to be fighting these guys thinking, oh, am I good enough or not? I want to get in there and know. So I just went out to Thailand and I, I learned to fight their, their way and I probably had about 15 fights there over the space of two years. Um, so I was fighting really regular and I had some of the best, best experience in my life and some of the worst. <laughs> Um, going over to Thailand, a lot of people struggle to get out of their comfort zone. For me, what I take from that experience that you had there was, obviously you didn't speak the language, it's a foreign country, you went over there on your own, so you're completely in a, in a place which is alien to you. You're stepping outside your comfort zone. Was that not something that put you off in the beginning or how did you deal with that when you got over there? Yeah, but that's how it's got to be. Um, the getting out of your comfort zone is massively important. And again, that, that comes down to the same thing as obsession, I've, I think. You can't just be comfortable in what you're doing. You need to be out of your comfort zone. Like in training, you need to be in six or to eight weeks out of your comfort zone. Otherwise, when you fight, it's going to be healthier. So that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to just, I wanted to be like, I said before, I don't want to be like a, a big fish in a small pond. I wanted to go over there and I went to a gym called Jitty Gym and it had a lot of Thai champions in at the time and top level guys. So I wanted to, to live like they did. I wanted to train how they did and, um, for the first like three, four weeks until I got used to it, it were, it were hell. I was living on a mattress on the floor, just like the ties did. And I'd, I said to them, just treat me how you, how you treat anyone else. And they did, I, they had me fighting every three, four weeks, um, which I loved. Um, but yeah, it, were, it, was, it got tough at some points because I was out there fighting for money as well. I was only 18 when I went, I'd not had too much money saved up. Um, I just went out there and I was fighting for money. At, at one point I was like, I'd be running low on money if my body's at, a bit banged up and I'm injured, it didn't matter, I had to fight. You either fight or go home. So that's what I did. I, I just used to fight as, as often as I could, as regular as I could. I worked on the things I want that as good at as like clinch work, like the ties are masters of it and the Westerners are okay, but they're not as good as the ties. I clinched every day with like Thai champions. Um, I made sure again, like there were a Thai trainer there called Rajasak. Training finished at 6 p.m. every night. It was three in the afternoon till 6 p.m. I were always there at 6.45, still doing bits of extra work with him, um, trying to bring myself up because these guys over in Thailand, they've all been doing it since six years old. It's second nature to them. So I'm trying to catch them up. So if I've got, that means staying late while everyone else is eating dinner, that's what I'm willing to do. And would you always stay late? Is that something that you kind of, you, you live your life by? You're always putting that extra work? Well, to be honest, in Thailand, I didn't have a choice. They just, just don't make me do it. Um, because what happens is as well, don't forget, like there's a big gambling culture in Thailand. So if I had a big fight out there, they were probably going to get some money gambled on it. They were going to be betting. So if they thought I want in as top shape as possible, then they wouldn't whip me into shape. And I mean, like they'd have me up at six running and I'd be the last one out the gym at 6 p.m. at night and they'd make sure that I were on point. Sounds like a lot of pressure, especially you go there and you're in a gym full of world champions and then you've got people that are pressuring you to work hard. Maybe they're doing some money on you in terms of your performance. How do you deal with that pressure, especially in a foreign country? Well, I didn't help myself because I was like, well, what we're doing as well is I was betting on myself when I used to fight. Like I say, I was there for money. And I said, right, I'm going to bet on myself. So if I didn't win, I had no money. So I had to win. <laughs> I had to win. But at one time I bet on myself and the whole gym bet on me and I lost. And um, I'd bet all my rent money on myself and everything and I lost the fight. And then three days later, I was I banged up badly. And he said, look, you ain't got no money. What are you going to do? I said, I'm going to have to fight again. So three days later, I got flown down to Phuket, one of the islands, and I had to fight again for my rent money. Um, and I, I won that fight by knockout in round three because the fighters in Phuket, luckily enough, 
for me, they're not as strong as the Bangkok guys. The Bangkok guys are the elite of the elite. That's why Muay Thai is the, is the capital in Bangkok. Um, luckily, I went down to Phuket. I still got a decent wage and I paid my rent for two months then. But yeah, to fight three days after having a really hard fight, I lost on points. And then to go down there and have to do it again three days later was not nice. You said that you obviously you had to, basically you had to fight to live. So there's a big difference between fighting because you love the sport, but you go over there at 18 years old and you're fighting to live. It's a lot of pressure to deal with. You said that you slept on a mat on the floor in the gym. When you, when you say that, is it literally a mat on the floor? Yeah, it was just a, just a mattress. Yeah, it's like a mattress thrown on the floor. Um, it's what all the Thais slept on. And I said, like I said, I wanted to do it the way they did. So that's what I did as well. But after about six months, I just couldn't take it anymore. Uh, so I just moved out then into a bit of an apartment next next to the gym. I want to talk about fear because what, what you kind of do, most people would be too scared to do, especially moving to a different country and training with people that you might seem to be elite at the time. The things that normal people fear, maybe you don't. So what kind of fears do you have? Um, it's a tough one. My fears at the time were thinking I wasn't as good as I thought I was. So that's why I wanted to go put myself right. I had to face my fears. I had to go to Thailand and, and train with these guys and fight them in Thailand because I thought maybe I'm not as good as I think. I thought there's only one way to find out. And go over there and then I just have to fight with them every time. I have to train with them every day. And by doing that, that brought me up to the next level. And um, I was lucky really, like the experiences I had out there, not a lot of fighters these days, they'll, they'll get them because there's a lot more exposure for Thai boxers and fighters now. They're, they're getting signed by big organisations like One Championship and other fight organisations earlier. So they're missing out on all these experiences that I had, like where I was fighting every three, four weeks or every three days or whatever. They missed out on this and this is it. It's life experience as well. Like I've got a lot of like crazy stories that other fighters aren't going to have. Um, and I won't change any of it for the world. So yeah, I went out there and I faced my fears, but look where it's got me now. It was like the, the end goal of all that was always more important than any fear that I ever felt. You spoke about crazy stories and, and crazy experiences. What was one of the kind of craziest things that happened to you in Thailand? That... Well, over the, I, that probably one where I lost all my money and I had to fight again three days later, a bad one. But even I was in the gym once. I'd, what I did was I'd flown up, I'd been there for six months. I'd flown home just to see my mum and dad for two weeks and then flown back to Thailand. So within the two weeks, I'd obviously been on piss with my friends and that. I'd not been training in England or having a rest. I got back to Thailand. That first day of training, there were a promoter walking around the gym and Jitty went, oh, I want you to go fight pro boxing in Cambodia. I said, I've never fought pro boxing. He said, oh, it's all right, just go do it. And I jokingly said, yeah, all right, whatever. And then he came back in the next day and I thought I wasn't going to hear anything about it again. And he started taking photos of me. I said, Jitty, what's this guy doing? And he said, you're fighting pro boxing. I said, I don't want to fight. I said, I've never fought pro boxing. He said, you punch hard, you'll be OK. I said, Jitty, I'm not doing it. He said, it's double the money you get for Thai boxing. I went, all right, we'll do it. I said, all right, just this time, one time. So I had to go to Cambodia and I said, okay, to my Thai coach, I said, when, when, what day are we coming? He went, oh, I can't go. I said, what do you mean you can't go? He said, they want to make it look like we've, they've flown you in from England. So you've got to go with another Western person. So I had to go with just one of the other fighters who were training there. We we're no coach or anything. My friend Adam, we went with, and he didn't really know anything about boxing or anything. He didn't know anything about Thai boxing. He would do a jujitsu guy, to be fair. So I went, all right, no worries. So I said, who am I fighting? The guy, my Thai trainer said, don't worry, he's rubbish. You'll knock him out. I said, what weight? I said, 65 kilo, I think he told me. And at the time, I were only fighting at 62 kilo. So it were a bit heavy, so I went, all right, no problem. Um, I only had like a week to prepare for the fight, so I wasn't fit either. And then when we flown into Cambodia, they flown me in on a propeller plane. And I was thinking, how do these guys think I've flown on a propeller plane all the way from England? If they're trying to make it look like I've come from England. So I turned up and there's all these newspapers. When the plane landed in all these newspapers and TV and everything. And I'm thinking, I thought this guy's crap. I thought, if he can't be that crap, of all the TV are here waiting for me. And then I sat in back of this bus and some guy gave me a newspaper. And he opened it up and he had my opponent on the middle page of the newspaper, a big spread, Cambodian number one boxing champion. And I thought, oh my God, I thought I'd been stitched up so bad here. So we went to check the weight. I jumped on the scales and I was 67 and I was told the fighter at 65. So I started putting the, the sweatsuit on and the promoter went, what are you doing? I went, lose two kilo. He went, no, gain two kilo. He said, you're underweight. I said, what do you mean I'm underweight? He said, fight 65. I said, no, 69. 
I thought, oh my God, I thought I was fighting at 62 at the time. I thought I'm going to get absolutely destroyed here. Um, came down to it on the day of the fight and we came out and I'd not really been doing much boxing training. What my Thai coach said to me, he said, you're not fit, so train like you're still fighting Thai boxing and kick the pads and knee because it's harder than just boxing. And I don't know where this logic came from, but I went, all right, whatever. And I got absolutely punched all over for the first round and a half. I brought my nose in the first round and I just had no idea what I was going to do. It was a six round fight. I'm thinking, what am I doing here? And in round two, I dropped him with a left hook and he was out starfished. And I was running around the ring, jumping on the ropes, celebrating and stuff like that. And it must have been about 20 seconds that I was running around for. And I turned around and the ref was still counting, going five, six, like that slow. And I'm thinking, what's going on here? And eventually on eight, he picked him up off the floor and stood him up and then went fight. So I ran back in again. I dropped him again, and then this time his nose was bleeding, so the ref picked him back up again, didn't give him a count, took him over to his corner, gave him a drink of water, wiped his nose, and then sent him back out again, and then the bell went, and I'm going, oh my God, I thought, I'm, there's not a chance I'm gonna win this fight here. I dropped him again in round four, and then dropped him again in round six, and the ref just picked him up off the floor every time and wouldn't stop the fight. So I dropped him like four times altogether. So luckily, there were no way they could have like give it against me on points because I'd had four, ten, eight rounds and I won on points. And I just thought, I am never, ever going back there to fight again. And then the next week when I got back to Bangkok, they said, oh, we want you to go back. We've got another fight for your boxing. And Jitter went, oh, they're going to give pay you double. I went, don't care. They're not going. I said, you're not sending me ever to do that ever again. You stitched me right up. You spoke about fears and you spoke about that. And it sounded like one of your biggest fears might be doubting yourself, how good are you? A lot of people worry about other people doubting them. You kind of, it sounded like you decided you were going to be a world champion at the age of 14 or 15. So you had that confidence, but when you was around that time, did anybody doubt you? Did you get a lot of people think that maybe came across with their opinion that maybe you won't make it? And if so, how do you deal with that? You know what? There was a teacher in my, in my primary, in my high school, sorry, and I will never forget what he said to me. Um, I'd been bad in English one time and he kicked me out of the class. And I remember he said to me, he said, what do you think you're going to do with your life? Be a pro fighter? Because I'll tell you now, that won't ever happen. And I remember just thinking, oh, right, I will show you. Uh, so if you're watching, Mr. Hill, guess what I, guess, guess what I am now? Um, but yeah, it were, yeah, I'll never, ever forget that. But you know what, I was lucky. I had, uh, I had such support in family and like friends and stuff like that who, who like pushed me in towards my dream and stuff. I get more haters now and more doubters now, even though I've already done it all already than I ever did back then, to be honest. Um, so, no, I, I didn't really have many people around me. Like I, I used to always surround myself with people who'd push me and obviously my family was so supportive and stuff, so I was lucky, really. Sounds like doubt has drove you on. Mm. Yeah, and that's a good way to look at it. And it sounds like an experience from your past you had kind of helped shape you into the person you are today. And that was one of the questions I wanted to ask. I, I wanted to ask a question of, can you think of any experience you, experiences you had in your younger years that had a real influential effect on you and the person you are today? Ooh, a lot of my younger years have all come down to like fighting and stuff like that. So probably just walking through this gym door for the first time, this changed my life. Like I said, I was being a bit naughty and stuff and being a bit mischievous when I was younger. But like walking through this gym for the first time like molded me into everything I am today. Um, it taught me discipline, it taught me respect, it taught me obsession, it taught me everything that I've needed in life to get to where I want to be. Um, and it's, it's been a, an absolute godsend for me because like I said, I was, maybe I'd be ended up going down the wrong path a little bit if I'd have carried on just running around the streets and being naughty. A lot of people who I know from back then are all in jail now. And like I said, I spent most of my days in this gym working hard to what, towards what I wanted to achieve. So I have the best memory from when I was younger is walking through these doors. In your career, you've obviously had massive highs, but anybody who reaches a certain amount of success, it, there's highs and there's lows. Um, with them highs and lows, you can feel like you're on top of the world at one point. Can you think of a time where you felt really low? And there's going to be a lot of people out there who do feel low, maybe in just their day-to-day -day life. How do you combat that? How do you kind of deal with that? Going back to that fight I run about against Anawat, about when the first time when he absolutely smashed me to pieces, that was uh, the first time I'd ever been stopped. It was something I never experienced before. It was something I didn't think possible at the time because I thought, oh, bulletproof. Um, and I don't think I'd ever really been hurt too bad in a fight before, before that fight, and let alone get stopped. So obviously if, to come back from something like that, it takes a lot of hard work, 
a lot of mental strength, a lot of mental fortitude, and you do have to do a bit of soul searching and you have to question yourself, but it, it all comes down to is the juice worth the squeeze and is it worth putting everything else back in? Um, or are you just gonna quit and just let that be like that? So that fight probably. Um, a few times I've had a few de pretty bad injuries. I've brought my hand and I had to get it plated up and I've had to pull out fights for it. And I actually got stripped of my WBC world title, which is probably one of the best world titles to hold. So that was tough coming back from that. Um, but from that, I've got a, now got a chance, I think early next year to fight for the WBC title again. So I could again just stopped and felt sorry for myself then, but I haven't, I've combated through, I've gone through it. Um, also when my knee, my knee injury or a bad one, like I could have just sat around like getting fat and being lazy. I still found a way to train and to keep my weight down and to look after myself. I had knee surgery in February and I fought again three months later. The doctor even told me, he said, don't train for three months. And I had a fight after three months. It all comes down to that. And that's the most powerful weapon you've got. And my knee, my whole camp was building my knee up. And then I fought on one championship, the biggest fight organization in the world. And I won fight at night. So that's down to that. It's how bad do you want it? And how bad, willing, how much can you let that control you or not control you? The kind of highs and lows that you have, has there been a, any point in time where them kind of lows have affected you like mentally? Do you think they've affected your life, your day to day? A little bit, yeah. Like I said about my knee then, I, I was sat around at first getting a bit depressed. I was putting a bit of weight on and stuff like that and I couldn't do anything. I'm used to being in the gym twice a day, teaching, seminars, everything. What happened was well, my meniscus tore and the bit that tore off got stuck in my knee joint. So my leg locked and I couldn't move it at all. And then I went to the hospital and they, I was getting referred all over the place. And it was taking a long time, but my knee was just locked. And I was like, when I get in the shower, I'd take my trousers off and I'm watching my leg muscle just waste away because I couldn't use it at all. And that was starting to play on my mind a little bit. And eventually I just woke up one day, I went to my doctor who was private. Uh, I said, I'll pay whatever to just fix this leg now. So then within that, I had an MRI right next day and I was in surgery three days later. Um, so I was lucky really that I just got off my ass and went and did something about it because if I'd have left it to NHS, they'd have just like, I'd have still waiting for my operation now, do you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, that was getting me down quite badly. But like I say, I got up and I went and did something about it myself. I didn't want to just wait for, and have my destiny in someone else's hands. I wanted to take control and go from there. Doing something about it yourself, uh, a lot of people, destiny in their own hands. A lot of people think that things are not in their control or they're not in their hands. How important is it, even when you've got an injury which you think is not solvable or it could be a problem with debt, it could be a problem with anything, how important is it for you to say, OK, I, I'm going to take control of it and find a solution? You have to do that. And again, like you just said, then it doesn't have to be to do with fighting, it can be to do with anything. Um, you can sit around and wait for stuff to happen or you can get out there and make things happen. And that is massively important in any walk of life. It doesn't matter who you are or what you do, you've got to get after it, you've got to chase it, you've got to make it happen yourself because no one's going to get gifted to you. You're going to have to work for it. And those people who are working and those people who are just grinding and they are going the extra hour, doing the extra mile, they're the ones that are going to be at the top. I want to read out a few words to you and then just want to get your kind of opinion of what these words mean to you. So it, when they pop into your head, what does it mean to you? So the first word is um, excuses. <laughs> Losers always have an excuse. Everyone who loses or something, losers have excuses. How about pain? That's a good one. You have to rise above the pain. I like that. Um, rising above pain. Everyone, has, everyone feels pain. There's no like person out there who's a terminator. Everyone does. It's just how you deal with the pain. That's what the, makes the difference. Mindset. A strong mindset is, I've said it before, everything comes down to that. A strong mindset will take you as far as you want to go in life. Success. Um, again, I, I believe that comes back down to mindset. Um, a strong mindset and willing to go that extra mile and obsession, that's a good one that comes with success. Being obsessed with whatever you're doing will bring you success. Loss. Part of life. Again, how you deal with it is what makes you a champion or what makes you just a normal person. Work. Again, I, that comes back to success. I think everyone who wants success, they have to do the hard work. Some people try and find a shortcut, but you should never want to try and find a shortcut. Hard work should always be like the, the main thing, and you should enjoy how hard you've got to work as well to get there, because it just makes it that much sweeter in the end. You do smash pads, smash people, smash bags very ferociously. You're quite vicious. You're putting a lot of hard work in. 
for somebody who looks at you from the outside, they might be asking the question of, how do you enjoy that? Because it looks painful and it, and it takes a lot of toll on your body and it, you have to expel a lot of energy. You generally enjoy the hard work you put in when you're in the ring or you're doing the training. I love it. I absolutely love it. It makes me... What does Arnold Schwarzenegger say about it? It makes him feel like he's coming every time he picks up a weight and stuff like that. Not quite that bad or quite that weird, but that's... I live for it. I absolutely love it. Like, nah, I'm lost at the minute because there's no fights going on. Um, but I'm still down here every day, smashing training and stuff like that. I don't train like a lot of fighters do, just when they have a fight, I do it because I, I love it and it's part of my life and it makes me just feel good about myself on a fight train for a couple of days. I feel like shit, you know what I mean? It's, I feel a bit down and a bit depressed and it only takes me to come in here and do one good session and I feel good about myself again. And I think a lot of people are like that, really. Um, but yeah, it's, like I said then, it's tough at the minute not having no fights to train for, but it's not going to stop me still coming down and looking after myself and, and smashing training and stuff like that. And yeah, it is painful. Don't get me wrong, it's, the fights are painful and there's been some times afterwards where I felt like I got hit by a bus and not been able to walk for two or three days and limping around and all my face smashed in and I think, what am I doing here? But then I realised the buzz you get when you're in, especially when you're in a gym full of other fighters and we've all got that same buzz and we're all fighting around the same time and we're all helping each other and pushing each other and then you've got other world champions around you and which makes you think how lucky you are and how lucky I am to ch chose this life. It's uh, nothing, nothing can compare to it, no. No other sport, no drug, nothing. I think the one thing I relate to you and, and the success that you've had and, and when, we speak, when we're speaking now is there's a, a mad amount of passion, there's a mad amount of love for what you do. How important is it to find something that you really enjoy doing, that you really love doing? Very important because I said earlier, I think, that you can only be truly good at something that you love. Uh, like I said, I tried other sports like K1 kickboxing style, which I should really, with the way I fight and how my style is, I should really be good at those sports. But it's a bit different to Muay Thai. The scoring is different. There's a few different rules that aren't the same. So I don't. I didn't enjoy it. So I was never successful at it because I wasn't enjoying my training. I was just like getting through it. I was still working hard, but I wasn't enjoying it. Like I'd never had that buzz when I was leaving. I just remember thinking, oh, I wish I could do this. I wish I could do that, which I couldn't. So I never like got the the buzz. So yeah, it is massively important to find something you truly, truly love. Biggest high of your career? The win against Dana Watt in 2010. Um, nothing, nothing will ever, um, nothing will ever come, come close to that one, I don't think. I had another one in 2012 against an 18-time world champion called Andre Kulbin, and everyone wrote me off before the fight, and everyone. I was moving up a weight division. He'd already knocked out the number one in the weight division below me. He was 18-time world champion. Um, and everyone wrote me off before the fight. And I told everyone, I said, I'm going to destroy him. I said, I will destroy him. I said, his style won't work with mine. And I stopped him in round three. So that one and the Anawat one are the, the two best. So I noticed you said, is the juice worth the squeeze? And that might sound like a, um, a bit of an abstract thing for somebody. What do you mean by that? How is it, how important is it? Is it worth it? In, is the end goal worth all the hard work that you're putting through? Is it worth dragging yourself out of bed when your body's in pain? Is it worth getting in there and sparring with some guy who's probably a lot better than you, but you're trying to better yourself? Is it worth round five when you're exhausted and there's 30 seconds left and the fight's even? Is it worth pushing yourself that little bit extra? Is it worth doing running an extra mile? Is it worth getting up at six in the morning doing hill sprints? Is it worth it? And the answer will always be for me, yes. You spoke about David Goggins and the, and the mindset he uses to push himself through. 100 mile races or run for 24 hours in it and, and you've adopted that mindset yourself. Uh, with what David Goggins is doing, is that something you took inspiration from? It's a little bit extreme to say what he's doing. He's probably just destroying his body. Like, surely his, his body can't take much more of that. I don't think I could do 100 mile races, but yeah, it is like similar because obviously I push myself in training to the point where I feel physically sick. Um, I'll be the first one through the door and I'll be the last one out of it at the end of training and stuff like that. So I do take little snippets from stuff like that. Sometimes I might look at my phone and my Instagram or something, I'll be feeling a bit tired and I'll see him like running down the street going, motherfucker, you gotta do it, do And I go, oh, I'm going to gym, I'm going to gym. I might think, might think I'm having a night off or something like that, but I might each catch one of them and you're like, shit, I'm going to gym. Do you know what I mean? He's, he's an incredible human being. He's also a bit crazy, I think, but he's incredible. We spoke about you highest point of your career. What are your plans for the future? Where do you see yourself going from here? 34 now, but when I'm actually training and when I'm in the floor, I still feel 
as fit, as sharp, as strong as I did when I was 24, 10 years ago. Um, I'm still winning. I'm still at the top level. I feel like I'm hitting harder than ever. Um, and I'm signed to the best fight organisation in the world. So I think I've got a few good years left in me yet. And I just want to keep pushing. I want to keep teaching my seminars, keep like spreading my style of Muay Thai around the world um, and just keep fighting for as long as I can. Thanks for your time. I really appreciate that. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Thanks for watching guys. If you enjoyed this video, please go show Liam some love. His channel is linked in the description. If you want to support projects like this in the future, please consider becoming a Mulligan Brothers YouTube member. And also, if you want to see the behind the scenes to how this was made, you can find our studio channel in the description. You can follow us on Instagram, at Mulligan Brothers. And as always, have a blessed and productive day. Thanks for watching.